Now, here we go. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. We got a very uh, uh, known man here. Everybody likes to hear what he has to say. Uh, we want to welcome renowned master dog trainer of the last 50 years, Gypsy of Rock Channel. He's the founder of the PPDA, that's the Personal Protection Dog Association, and last living co-founder of the original Canis Panther Dog and husband to, uh, husband to Mrs. Lori. That, that's right. right. Guys. Now, that's my claim to fame right there. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I understand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um. So I guess we're going to jump right into it because we're going to kind of keep a tight schedule tonight. Um, so this is going to be a one hour presentation and I'm going I'm to I'm kind of keep a watch this on this clock. Um, anything you want to start out with, Gypsy? Give me a second. I... Where do we get? All right. Uh, I'll just ask you, just, was there any before we started, was there anything you wanted to say uh, uh, or, or I could start asking questions? Uh, yeah, I do want I, I do want to tell you. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll follow you. Okay. I'll follow your lead. Okay. So uh, today's uh, subject, uh, we asked Gypsy to uh, talk on uh, what a protection dog trainer should know, the things he should know. But I'm going to kind of just, uh, I don't want to lead him, but I'm going to ask a, a few questions and uh, then we just kind of let him jump off into it. Just let him go. Um, Gypsy, when, when, when did you first realize your love for dogs? Oh, boy. I was a little guy, maybe six or seven. Um, um, I was my mom's only child. So she worked two jobs. So it was me and the dog at home. So I had to be a little bit over seven. Uh, but I, I come home, I had a key around my neck going to school. I'd come home by myself and it was me and the dog until she got home. So I guess it was just uh, uh, natural that uh, I, uh, you know, when you open the door and somebody's there wagging their tail and wanting to hug and kiss you, you fall in love. But here's when uh, I realized what a dog was for. Uh, that's also uh, in, this, uh, in this book. Wait a minute. There you go. There it is. Owner's yeah. Guide to Raising Your Pet Protector. Um, I explained that experience. Uh, that's the one. Yes, those are our dogs on there too. And my wife took those <laughs> photographs. Very talented. Very, very. yes, very. yes. So I was, um, I was a little guy and uh, we had a dog named Bobby. And all that we could tell was uh, he was a collie mix. Um, we don't know what the other side of it was, but definitely a collie mix. And Bobby kind of stayed on, we had a, a, um, a, a indoor back porch, enclosed back porch. So he stayed out there a lot of the time, but with the door open, he had free uh, uh, room to all over the house. So me and my mom was there and my mom was real, she was an attractive woman, uh, no man in the house though. So it was me and her and Bobby. So one day, uh, my mom and I are in the house and I hear, we all hear uh, a lot of noise, crashing, uh, uh, coming from the bathroom. Now the bathroom is a window right off the back porch. So we go into the bathroom and right in front of us, there's a guy breaking in, this broad daylight, breaking in to the bathroom window. So before I know it, you know, me and my mom, she's kind of, uh, hiding me or whatever and I we're both looking at him looking at us so it wasn't like he was even oh god I've been discovered let me run away he's looking at his target his prey so Bobby runs into the bathroom jumps up I, I guess it was the tub into the uh windowsill and literally fights this guy preventing him from getting in the house um that's the moment it crystallized. That's what a dog is for. So from that moment on, I knew what a dog was for now. So Bobby, uh, that experience 
got so deep in my head that I guess that's why I've always gravitated to protection, personal protection. Yeah. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah. It did. It, it it actually knocked out my second question too. So um let me ask you this. Who who influenced you in your professional dog training career? Okay, so before I was a professional, my grandmother, my auntie, my grandmother Helen, my auntie Gladys, my godmother, Jean. And of course, my mother, Dolores, were my greatest influences because, you know, my mom working two jobs had to have, you know, help and made with babysit me. Well, all of them had a dog. Uh, my um, uh, Auntie Jean and her mother had Mitzi and Tilly. They were some kind of great dame. They were huge dogs, two of them. And uh, they lived on the back porch mostly. Um, and I remember uh, Bert, my Auntie Jean's mother, always telling me, boy, be careful with them dogs, you know, because uh, they were real dogs. But they liked me because I loved them, I guess. They never tried to hurt me, never even uh, threatened me. But uh, they were real. So Bert was always telling me, be careful, be careful. You know, dogs bite. I, even to this day, I tell people, didn't your grandmama tell you dogs bite? You know, when when uh, when uh, I talk to some trainers who are uh, mystified or uh, addicted to the bite, uh, I, I tell them, you know, dogs bite. You you don't have to spend ninety percent of your training time teaching them to bite because they do. Didn't your grandmama tell you that? Uh, then so that's Auntie Jean and my aunt Gladys had uh, Buster. Buster was some kind of chow mix. And the way we knew that, because he was black, had the curled tail, but he had black on his tongue. Uh, Buster stayed by the door. My Auntie Gladys had a lot of kids. I had a lot of cousins. And uh, if you came to the house, you couldn't just walk in, not even with one of us, because Buster would bite you, period. Mm -hmm. um, and so people learned. And that was down on 63rd Street, right off of the Jackson Park. I forget the Woodlawn might have been the name of the street. But uh, uh, in those days, the Stones was running everything. I don't know if you're familiar with the Black. Uh, oh, that, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Basically ran the community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because there were a lot of kids in the family, uh, uh, of course, a lot of times, um, you know, guys would try to come visit or whatever. There were a lot mm -hmm. of girls too in the family. So Buster yeah. would camp out. He would post up at the door and, you know, he'd be almost invisible. Now, none of these dogs were trained. Um, uh, my grandmother, uh, Helen, had Gertrude, a Doberman, and she was pure Doberman. My father have always had uh, purebred dogs. Uh, Gertie uh, was a real watchdog right there on 67th Street, uh, a few blocks before Damon, uh, two houses down from the railroad tracks. Uh, so, you know, there's always a lot of traffic going back and forth, guys that drink on the railroad tracks, all that kind of stuff. None of these women ever had a problem. Nobody, and they were all single, nobody came to their house disrespectfully, uh, never anybody tried to break in but you didn't even raise your voice. Nobody stood in front of their house. Uh, and it's because they had real dogs. So when you say uh, influence me, influence is the first word. Professional is the second. Influence me to, um, uh, so who, who influenced me? Well, my grandma, uh, Helen, my auntie Gladys, my godmother, Jean, and my mother, Dolores, because of the dogs that they had, of course, Bobby uh, being my mom's dog. And they always had a dog. And they had a dog for years. You know, Buster, they didn't have a dog like nowadays. You get a dog and two years later, he's gone. He's in the uh, uh, shelter or something. They raised dogs. And that's why I think mm -hmm. this book is about raising your pet protector. So these dogs were pets that protected. So I learned a lot from them about how to raise a dog. 
so professionally, uh, my father took me to Earl Jones. I had gone, to, I wanted to learn to train dogs. I was gonna go into the military after high school. Uh, but I had played football in high school and had broken uh, my shoulder. So when I went to take the test for the military, of course, thank God, I tested very high. So everybody wanted me, uh, you know, but then you go into the doctor and the doctor saw the big surgical scar and uh, that's it for that. So of course I'm crying and, you know, I wanted to learn how to train dogs and the military, of course, was gonna be my, was my uh, pinnacle. So my father said, well, I'm gonna take you to somebody I know. And that was Earl Jones. And Earl Jones was all about defense. And so actually it worked out because if I had gone to the military, I'd be doing what all these other guys are doing. Military, watered down police and or sport. Where yes. Earl was all defense. Yeah. Okay. So that's when I learned it. Uh, and that was my uh, professional influence, Earl Jones, to be honest. And thank God, he's the most professional uh, brother I've ever known um, um, training dogs. And as a matter of fact, my father is the breeder of his dog. Uh, Tobar the Great, Doberman. Yeah. My dad, like I said, my dad was always into purebred dogs. Okay, cool. So Tobar and, is the greatest dog I've ever known. Go ahead. Okay, what I was I was going to say, uh, you guys, uh, Earl Jones, you can go over yeah. to Facebook on um, Gypsy Page, get on the videos, and he has a lot of interviews. And on uh, one of the videos, I believe, has Earl J Jones' son. And y'all kind of talk about it a little bit yes, deeper queen. over there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yes. so what what is your personal under the, PPD, under the PPDA? That's where it is. Personal Protection Dog Association on Facebook. Oh, yeah, that's that page. That's, okay. Okay. What is your personal dog training philosophy philosophy, Gypsy? Well, my personal philosophy would be to raise and train a dog who knows his job and his place is to defend the house and to defend the people in the house, whether in the house or not, but his primary job is to defend the home. And dogs learn their place. If you're not uh, uh, trying to turn them into children, they learn how to be dogs and they learn their place in the hierarchy of the group because dogs are pack animals genetically. And so in a pack, a young dog has to learn its place or it'll never get to be a, an old dog. Uh, he learns his place, he learns to learn, uh, learn behavior, he learns hierarchy, somebody's in charge, somebody's in charge of that dog, there's a leader and we follow, um, and we serve the pack. I learned a long time ago that the strength of the dog is the pack. The strength of the pack is the dog. And okay. so that means the strength. So therefore my real philosophy is teach a dog his place in mm -hmm. the hierarchy of the home. And they, right. they're genetically predisposed to uh, have that job. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, in the in the pet protective book, I was reading a little bit earlier, yes. guys. Get that book from Gypsy because he goes a little bit deeper in there. You was talking about something about popcorn therapy. Is that what it was? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So y'all get that book. I ain't gonna tell you what it is now. But uh, okay, okay. So, the, so this next question is uh, back to the Personal Protection Dog uh, Association. Yes. How and why was the PPDA formed? Okay, um, um, when was that, honey? PPDA uh, Federation. 98, probably 98. 97, 98. Mm -hmm. okay. My wife and I came up with the uh, uh, idea basically uh, because uh, when did the internet start happening? About, that. yeah, a little before that. So I was sharing, uh, trying to share knowledge and it was about uh protection dog training so i we had what was called the internet wars 
where uh, uh, I got uh, bumped heads with a lot of guys around the world, not just uh, in America, but established trainers from Europe, South America, uh, South Africa, um, um, the Middle East even. Um, mm -hmm. And most of them were using, they were uh, a border security uh, uh, and or military and then sport, especially the Europeans, the uh, Western Europeans, a lot of sport. And I wasn't talking any of those languages or those methods or methodology. I was talking purely personal protection. I have always said all defense all the time. That's my philosophy because that's what Bobby taught me that uh, <laughs> that's what they're for. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, with this uh, back and forth, I realized, or we both realized, well, we don't get a lot of respect. Uh, and then I also had learned mostly from Earl. You know, Earl, that was back in the seventies when I went, to, when my father took me to Earl. He's the greatest dog trainer I've ever known. But the sport guys refused to call him a professional. They called him a fancy dog trainer mm -hmm. because his demo was outstanding. And so they called him a fancy dog trainer. He didn't use treats. He didn't use tugs or balls to get dogs to walk between his legs and uh, you know the uh, quickly turn and get in place and all that kind of stuff. No. Uh, so I realized early that there's a lack of respect. Then the other thing I realized is that there's a, there are three poisons to our business, the protection dog or the dog training community. And so um, those three things are jealousy, insecurity, and selfishness. Mm -hmm. uh, dog trainers, let me just say this. Dog trainers got to screw loose. All of us, me, my wife, you, <laughs> everybody that gravitates to animals instead of people have a maladjustment. But at some point, we use it to enrich our lives and even people like myself and my wife, we use it to enrich other people's lives. My wife is a very accomplished um, uh, handler in protection and also a master at uh, therapy dog training. She's trained hundreds and hundreds of dogs that are uh, insured up to a million dollars. This is not a, a small thing uh, right. that somebody is willing to insure a dog for a million bucks because they've gone through her program. So, so uh, we've learned that our uh, maladjusted uh, 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 psych psyche, uh, how to make it uh, 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 valuable, not just to our own lives, but other people's lives. I'm trying not to forget the uh, question. I'm getting no, no, you, you're doing out. wonderful. So, so, so the PPDA was formed along with some great, great, great dog trainers. I mean, fabulous men. Um, Mel McDuffie and Joe Kidd, um, Dean Buntley, uh, Dave Robinson, um, uh, so just to name a few of the core group. But one of the greatest dog men who was my partner at the time, Scorpio Jones, refused to come to that first meeting. And that's because he didn't think any of them were at his level. Uh, that's, again, one of the problems in uh, our profession. So that's why the PPDA was formed, in order to acknowledge each other's level of perfection and became a, um, um, a, a body that would acknowledge other trainers. Because before that, in our community, there was no um, mechanism to be certified as a professional or to be rec recognized as a professional. Uh, the, and I didn't want it to be a club because uh, clubs usually turn into democracies. And I'm not into democracy because most of the people don't know as much as I know. So why should they tell the, the, the masters what to do? I'm not going to have people vote because that's popularity. 
I am not interested in being popular. I only care about being correct. Um, and so we, those other uh, trainers that I mentioned are true masters and we certified each other. Uh, that was the beginning of it. And, uh, and then we had uh, tournaments where we would associate with each other. So we never made rules for them. They had their own rules. We would participate in each other's competitions because back in those days, Chicago was a hotbed of competition, personal protection, dog shows. I mean, lots of them. Okay. Uh, and they were high level. Uh, but uh, again, I didn't, I wasn't interested in a club because clubs get to vote and I'm not interested in popularity. I'm interested gotcha. in correctness, excellence. And uh, these people that I mentioned were very excellent dog trainers. So uh, that would take care of the jealousy and the insecurity. And more importantly, the selfishness part, because in our business, we're all they we seem to be jealous of each other uh it's a dog eat dog world mm -hmm. so to speak uh, yeah. we all prey on each other uh and and we all are competing for the same 20 or 30 dogs uh and and so we've always been afraid to uh bring our dogs that we're training around other great trainers because you look up two weeks later those people are over there training with that other person. So jealousy and then insecurity, of course, follows jealousy. Um, gotcha. And so that's why it was formed to uh, address those three weaknesses. Uh, and of course, and of course, to promote personal protection versus uh, uh, sport. Uh, because uh, also in the 70s, sports started becoming um, um, popular. Uh, and I must say, uh, and it, as it started, it was racially influenced. Uh, most of the KMVP, Schutzen, whatever, were administered to and uh, participation was mostly white people. And mm -hmm. they did not uh, uh, readily uh, uh, allow us in the group. Uh, and especially give us the or acknowledge us to the level of training uh the first part of it was you could be a decoy and usually that was because of our uh, we had you know athleticism or whatever it takes to be a decoy training though is cerebral training is i have always said the formula for a trainer is whoever designs the program who implements the program and who does quality control over the process. That is who the trainer is. Yes. Um, not the person who's just in front of the dog agitating or shaking stuff or taking bites. That is uh, an agitator in the personal protection world, but in the sport world, it's called a decoy. And once you put in the decoy category, that's it. You're not going anywhere else. Uh, and so uh, training is more important to me. Um, and so those are the reasons that the Personal Protection Dog Association was formed. Yeah. Gotcha. So, I, Gypsy, all, you, I, you... I just go on and on, I know. So, Gypsy, you've been in this game a very long time. Yes. And so... It's all I know. I don't so, even know how to change a tire on a car. All <laughs> I know is how to train dogs. And that's the truth. So being that, being that, that it is, where do you see the dog training world in the next five to 10 years? I am um, fearful for the dog training world. Um, other people who have asked this question always come up with the positive answer. Oh, I think it's gonna be great. That's because there's more popularity involved now in dogs and dog training and sport uh, feeds into that popular movement. Whereas, I uh, think that the uh, protection trainer has a more valuable job, a more um, uh, needed uh, job for the society, especially in the community, especially in communities where there may be um, uh, dearth, uh, uh, drugs, gangs, um, 
uh, unemployment, because those are the things that lead to violence, home invasion, um, assault. And so personal protection is not a hobby, whereas sport is usually a hobby um, and is done for trophies and spectators uh, entertainment. Whereas I've always said, uh, I don't train for shows. I train for the showdown. Yeah. And the showdown comes and goes by your house every other day. Uh, you have sometimes you don't even know that the showdown has occurred, but your dog does. Your dog will pick him. I see you coming, and I'm going to mm -hmm. let you know. This is not where you want to stop, and, and uh, I'm not going to curse, but F yeah. around. You yeah. don't want that over here. You want to keep going. That's right. And that's a showdown. Uh, uh, bad guys are cowards and so they look for vulnerability uh, and if you have a real and, and a favorite dog is the watchdog um, and that's what my grandmother my auntie my godmother my mom had watchdogs but you you train a watchdog he becomes a professional uh, soldier let's say a professional bodyguard your frame is frozen. Are you still able to hear me? Yeah, I'm, I can hear you. Yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, you, we move. I now. got you. You're back. Okay. So uh, I think that a hobby is fine. I love uh, dogs so much that I love frisbee catching dogs. I love dock diving dogs. Uh, I even like sport dogs, uh, but they're not important. They're not essential. So I believe that a protection dog trainer has a higher calling. And what disturbs me, you ask about the five to 10 year outlook, is that sport has become more prevalent, even to the point that sport trainers will deceive the church lady, the bus driver, the person who has a job, who's not interested in going to the sport field to get a trophy, they have to go to work. And they wanna know when they get home from church or work, that their big screen is still going to be in the house, that their family is still protected from all these ne'er-do-wells who uh, roam their area. Now, I've uh, learned that um, even in the more effluent areas, people sometimes don't take their, their medicine or they fall in love with a stripper and go crazy. Any number of things can turn a person into a ne'er-do-well. And the dare to will needs money. And he's going to figure you've got it because you're going to work every day. Or you're cute and he wants to push up on you. Where a protection dog, again, those showdowns come. When that guy walks past your house and looks at your daughter and looks right past her and there's your dog looking right at him, there's a whole different script. Now, he, he, it's not going to happen. They're going to keep moving. You understand what I'm saying? You did, Gypsy. So you you worked with a lot yeah. of different dogs. What was you you're fading? You're gonna to have to repeat that. You're fading. Your frame is frozen again. Can't hear you. Okay. I see me. I'm not frozen. He is. Recording. Okay, it's fluctuating. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear now. me? Yes. Okay. You're back. You're back. Okay. I can All hear right. you. Okay. I'm oh, sorry about this. I guess. What was I'm your having... question? Uh, uh, I'll I'll uh, edit this too, so don't worry about that. So okay. who? Okay. Uh, who was one of the most? Uh, or if it's more than one the memorable dogs you have worked with? 
Well, Tobar the Great uh, belonged to Earl Jones. He was his principal dog. Um, and, and here we got, right here, that's Mick Mo Man, uh, okay. Rod Wilder. Okay. That my wife bred him. Uh, okay. And next to him is Chief, Chief Little Dog. Uh, okay. If you go to my uh, Facebook, you'll see Chief doing, I sent you a video of Chief today okay. doing gu gunfire. That was my dog. He was doing oh, okay. gunfire with Sean Jr. and uh, the great Kim McCoy uh, in the muzzle. Uh, and here is Asia, America's best pit bull. I also have video of her. Here, here is a, a, a heavy dog. He's the first uh, Johnson Bulldog. His father is the first Johnson Bulldog to receive a personal protection dog title. Okay. Um, and so, yes, these are some of the most influential dogs that I have known. And uh, I have to say that we've owned. They they were here at Rock of Ages Kennel, trained oh, here. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, other people's dogs, of course. Uh, I did mention Tobar, but many that I've trained, so many. I'll let other people that'll tell you. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Personal Protection Dog Association Facebook, when I'm interviewing these other trainers, these Hall of Famers, oh, uh, uh, these Hall of Famers, they will mention some dogs. And uh, most of those dogs they mentioned are dogs that I train. So those are influential too, but my dogs mean more to me. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, I'm glad they are influenced uh, by those dogs that I train. So uh, there are many dogs mentioned over there, Personal Protection Dog Association. Gotcha. Yeah, Facebook. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. Okay, Jeffrey, this is going to... When I'm going to ask you a, a big question here, and I just want you to take off with it. Uh, okay. And when you're that's what I do. Yeah, I know it. Uh, you're like a rocket. <laughs> when uh, okay. So I want you to speak to the young trainers. Uh, okay. And uh, if 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 it's something that you would just want them to know, just a few cute things. And maybe okay. even people who's looking for a dog trainer on what they should yes. be knowing. Yeah. Could you go ahead and just just spill your heart out right now? Yes. First, uh, on dog trainers, what they should know. Uh, I think the dog trainer should know that their job is to um, train their mission. They should learn what their mission is. Again, I think. Uh, sport and frisbee and jumping off docks and things of that nature, uh, even agility. I love agility. I think that they're important, but they're not essential. Personal protection is essential. And so if you are teaching sport, then please don't uh, masquerade it as protection because sport is based on police dog training and it uses that philosophy and that science to create those types of dogs. Police dogs are police dogs. They're not suited for civil uh, owners, for regular people. Uh, a, a police handler, that's his job. He has to be certified every six months that he's doing his job properly, that his dog is still up to snuff. Whereas when you train, when, when these sport trainers train a dog, there's nobody regulating them. There's no regulation. And so a trainer really needs to know what they're doing. Are they doing sport and saying it's protection or are they doing protection? So I'm a protection trainer. So I'm gonna take myself as the, uh, the model. When uh, someone calls me, when somebody calls me, I have questions for them. And the first question is, who's in the house? Are there children in the house? That's my first question. Uh, whether they're doing obedience and or protection. My first question is, are there children in the house? And that goes back to the hierarchy that dogs have genetically uh, uh, transcribed in their own brains and genetics. Somebody's the alpha or the strongest. Then there's somebody else on the next level. And then there's somebody 
who is at their level or less. And those are usually children. Dogs are more physical and emotional than they are logical. People are logical. Dogs go on, I'm stronger than you. I'm faster than you. And as a matter of fact, you are scared of my mouth. They learn that early. Uh, and so dogs tend to, uh, I don't want to say victimize, but pick on who they think is less. They tend to uh, obey who they think is greater and not uh, obey or care about uh, those who they consider less. That's what this popcorn therapy is about if, when you read it in the book. Um, and so that's my first question. Are there children in the house? And then my next question is, there, are there old people in the house? Because the dog has to respect everyone that's there. So when I ask these questions, that, get, that will govern how much fire I bring up out of this animal. Whereas the sport trainer, his whole goal is biting. I don't care what sport trainer it is. When you really drill down and ask them real questions, uh, especially even about their program, biting is the goal, not protecting. Pursuit and apprehension is the goal of the police dog. Sport is watered down police training. Um, and Schutzen, as great as it was and is, has been copied now. Schutzen had too many rules. So this place uh, decided to KMVP. I'm just picking uh, the alphabet soup. Um, APPDA, uh, even in the name of APPDA is patrol dog. Um, um, that's not suitable for the family. Um, so I asked those questions. I asked uh, uh, if a young single woman calls and wants training, um, especially if they show up and especially if they show up with their boyfriend. Uh, I asked them directly in front of him, is this the first boyfriend you've had? And of course, always the answer is no. Well, if it's not the first one you've had, I will say to them directly, then it's probable that he's not the last one. So this dog, if you're going to train for personal protection, has to be trained to protect you. Because at some point, you might say, I don't want to be with you no more. And men are stupid. Men don't believe uh, no means no. They think uh, they need to just push up on you and you're just going to crumble in their arms because that's what men are taught as boys, as young men, and even as uh, uh, seasoned men. They think machoism is the answer to everything. Uh, sometimes even they will get mad, want to punch holes in your, in your wall, scream and holler at you, threaten you, be physically Im imposing. Well, if you have, uh, if, if that young lady has, shared this dog equally, I, I will not let her boyfriend handle her dog when I train. I know this sounds very extreme. <laughs> this is not popular, <laughs> but this is correct. Um, if it is, a, if they have old people in the house, old people reach for things, maybe they shake a little bit. Uh, they are not as strong. And so um, you don't want to break as much trust uh, because trust breaking is part of defense, but you have to, a little bit of trust breaking goes a long way. So a lot of times, if you're not thinking with the trainer brain, you're thinking with the agitator brain, you're going to always try to give, leave them with a monster. And monsters are not good for families. They're not good for little children. They're not good for old people. Um, if you're going to keep a dog for 10 years, like my grandma and my aunties and my mother did, if you got the dog at, at 30, you're 40. Uh, uh, at some point, you're slower than you were. And the dog needs to be taught not to take advantage of your lack of strength and or agility and or quickness, which dogs will do. Sport is basically about uh, um, athleticism uh, to handle, which uh, that's another subject, and hopefully at some point we'll talk about handling as a real subject. Um, uh, it's, it's different. You may have blew your knee out three years ago or just last month. Your dog can't say, oh, you're, 
you're not fit anymore. I'm going to take over now and be less submissive. Um, so I ask these questions. I'll even ask, uh, uh, what, what made you decide you wanted to do protection? Did you look out the window and see a creepy person uh, trying to look in your house? Or I ask those questions because those are the things that are essential. First off, it lets the prospective client know that you are all about what you claim to be about, their personal protection. Excuse me. Let me turn this off. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what the trainer, a real trainer, a real protection trainer needs to know these particulars about who's in the household. Then, of course, the dog, how old, what kind of dog. And so here's a big thing that I learned. Earl taught me this. Um, sport guys, <clears throat> a lot of times have their own dogs. They have a litter. They want to sell their dog. So the church lady shows up with her dog, who's a mope. The church lady dog been called baby and come here, honey, and go lay down, sweetie. Uh, it's whole life. Then it shows up and it doesn't have the requisite drive is the, the uh, word. Uh, drive, you know, um, and so they'll tell you, the church lady, well, this one don't got it, but my boy, my my cousin, my friend, he's got a litter with a lot of drive, or he has one himself. Well, you can't, if you're a real protection dog trainer, you can't tell the church lady, get rid of her dog, because she looks at that dog as part of her family. Most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a real trainer, you're going to do your best to uh, uh, train this dog to uh, come to some level of protection. Some level of protection is better than no level of protection. But what is not better is overdoing it. Sport trainers want to create monsters, biting monsters. Ask any of them. Don't tell them what your question is about. Just let them talk and you'll hear. Go look at them on the internet. Now that there's an internet, and you'll see it's about biting. Well, a protection dog does a lot more than just bite. Police dogs are taught to bite and hold with devastating bites. That's why most police dogs cannot be called out of a bite. They got to be choked out of a bite. Uh, police dogs bite policemen more than normal people's dogs bite them because they're interfering with the bite. Uh, a personal protection dog has to know why it's working, who it's working for. And it cannot be, I'm working for the bite. It has to be working for the person, for the household, for the family. And that is a different um, uh, um, approach, a different methodology, a different science. And that's what's important. And when I teach young people, that's what I'm teaching them. Uh, so those are the questions that I ask. Those are the things I have to know before I start. Uh, and then, of course, is it obedience and or protection or is it just obedience? Because I will not just do protection. You're going to have to do some OB so that you teach this dog control and who's in charge of this mouth. Who is it working for? And obedience does that. I hope I didn't say too much, but go ahead. You have no, more. No, you age. <laughs> you age. You got a, a, a lot of knowledge, Jip. I tell you that. Uh, so we're getting close Thank to you. being, uh, we, get, we got a lot of information in a short amount of time. So this go back ahead. end, I want to talk in, uh, about a little bit more about your program. So uh, I don't know if a lot of you yes. guys know. But uh, Gypsy and Miss Lori, they answer questions. They do consultations. And they also yes. do certifications. Uh, so, yes. I mean, you can get at them. So I'm going to let him talk about uh, the uh, consultations and certifications. Well, um, because I just love to talk. I love to teach is basically what I love to do. That if you call me, I'll sit there and teach you. And my wife, I'll look up and my wife will be burning a hole in my head, uh, <laughs> glaring at me uh, and saying, wait a minute, we need to pay bills. 
and and the game is to be sold not told and right. so that is true and this uh wealth of knowledge and experience i have needs to help me and my wife pay bills and so she has uh, uh created a system by which people can have their specific questions about their specific um situation and i will give them the benefit of my knowledge i do not try to waste time i go right to the issue uh, and if they want to really be effective they can pre uh they can tell me ahead of time what their questions are going to be and i can be prepared to address specific questions or their their specific problem because i believe in problem solving i don't just want to preach i want to teach and i want to solve their problem so my wife devised that uh, I, I it never occurred to me and even now uh, somebody will catch me and i'll answer the phone and uh, i can't help myself so uh, if you want to do uh, consultation you reach out to my wife at rock of ages kennel dot info website. it's a website what about the uh, email? email the email is rock of ages kennel at aol.com and then she will schedule the time she'll ask you your free questions so that i can be prepared to directly um, address your issues and so yes that's what that's about certification is about there are three ways that i certify uh, one way is uh, a trainer who is at a level that i respect a lot uh, will recommend someone and then i will go and my wife and i will go and research them we will just we don't tell them we're coming to look at you we just go look at uh what you have on your platform your training platform and you don't have to be me in order for me to certify you you don't even have to be a hundred percent uh my um philosophy skill and work and then some sense of mission will be apparent i'll see it uh, then I'll reach out to you and ask you if you're interested in being certified. I don't just do it off the top. You have to say, yes, I'm interested. If you like who? Personal Protection Dog Association, I don't care about, well, we pass right on by. Uh, another way is, um, what? No, he's asking about uh, certification. Uh, another way is through our titles. We have a basic obedience, two levels, titles, on lead and off lead. We also have uh, basic uh, protection titles. And you can go to the Personal Protection Dog Association Facebook, look for uh, Albert Cruz and his dog Isis are uh, showing the protection titles. He does it in biting and also in muzzle. Um, uh, and get what the title is about. If you title enough dogs, then I have to certify you because you have proven through the title system that you're a professional. Um, um, and the other way, there are three ways. And the third way is I raised you or you've been raised or taught, you've been mentored, taught, or the apprentice of uh, another really great trainer. And those are the three ways. How they can get their obedience title. Um, oh yeah, yes, that's right. No titles, yes, we yes, and and obedience is pretty simple. I don't uh, ask that your dog uh, jump off of uh, uh, platforms and into a perfect heel or, or between your legs and like military, you know, in the military they got the dog between their leg and they they're got their gun up and all that. I, I'm not in that. Church lady is never going to do any of that. Church lady don't want her dog between her legs she wants her dog to behave to to um uh, uh, uh obedience is basically cooperation following instruction if you have to muscle your dog through it you're not going to get it but if you can handle your dog um again the obedience uh, is is basic and simple on lead and then uh, basically the same program off lead. um uh, so basically that's that's how it goes gotcha gotcha all right well we got about nine minutes uh uh gypsy is there anything else 
you want to cover before we get out of here? No, I'm hoping that at some point we're going to talk specifically about uh, uh, handling. Handling, and yeah. that's going to take more than yeah, that's going to take more than nine minutes. If we can you do have that. questions from uh, people in the audience or whatever, I'd be glad to do that for these next nine minutes. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, no, only thing I see is somebody said, "Master teacher." <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Who is but that? I, uh, that's brother. I hope I Hecker. Yeah, brother Hecker. Yeah. Hecker. Yeah. Come on, Hecker is a deacon of the church. Okay. Yeah, I call. I call these young men that I have taught or that are being taught by uh, other uh, great or masters um, deacons of the church. Gotcha. Uh, there are some people who are certified that I do not call deacons of the church because their philosophy is not. Uh, uh, as holy as mine. It's not as pure as mine. Sometimes I say this is a religious experience to me because of the mission, because of why we do it. It makes it more holy. Sometimes I go crazy and I tell these guys, your mission you t is to become a, uh, a knight of the realm. Your job is to provide protection for God's people. And that gives it uh, a real uh, palpable uh, meaning why you're training to provide right. that protection uh it's not for uh accolades it's not for trophies it's not for uh oohs and ahs it's for the mission so hecka is uh a deacon of the church all there, right brother deacon they are go go ahead deacon hecka you want to ask something or De add something heck you want to say something let me unmute you bro let me hold on a second wait uh bam. Come on now. Okay, I think it's I think I think it's a. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Hey, Hacker. what's going on? Not much. How y'all doing today? Uh, we in it to win it. Good. I can Good. dig okay, it. I just got one guy. question for you, uh, Gypsy. You know, one of the main pushbacks that I get, uh, you know, when we say all defense all the time is, you know. Uh, we don't see the benefit in using prey. So I guess my question to you is, is there any benefit in using prey in personal protection training? Uh, there may be, but I don't see it. Uh, I think if a dog knows its job and is taught properly, it will travel a distance if necessary uh, to encounter, to uh, challenge, to um, encounter uh, a bad guy, uh, but in defense, uh, there's got to be um, a reason, not just because he's there, but because he can harm you from that distance. Uh, I know for a fact that defense is predicated on proximity. So a guy 50 feet or 100 feet away with a gun is not as dangerous as a man five feet away with a machete. I also know that. Uh, um, that can only be, that should and be the only moral and legal justification to send a dog a distance to uh, destroy a human being. They have to be able to harm you from that distance, not just insult you, not just make you mad, uh, uh, not just be uh, an uh, irritant. Uh, when you get in front of Judge Judy, you better be able to say that this person uh, uh, was a real threat that they could actually harm you from that distance. And once again, uh, defense is predicated on proximity. Uh, and so uh, that's what I would say. Uh, uh, I don't use prey at all. Uh, and the uh, phrase you use defense, all defense all the time. I noticed the video you had recently of your Rottweiler. And you guys were at the beach, I think, or at the lakefront. And your dog was going to the water. And you said no, and your dog came away from the water. And then a few minutes later, he was going to a little pool of water, which of course we all know in those pools, there's a lot of algae and probably something that's gonna make a dog sick. And he was about to put his head in that water, probably to drink, and you said no, and he stopped. That's defense. You were defending your dog. Your dog related to that no, 
and stopped doing what he was doing. He was off lead. You could not physically stop him from doing it. Your no stopped him from doing it. Your no would have stopped him from running into the Dan Ryan Expressway. Your no would have stopped him from uh, biting somebody who's jogging by and got headphones on or looking at their phone, not even aware you're there, who's encroaching on your personal space. So obedience is defensive, is defending ourselves and our dog from making mistakes. So that's what I mean when I say all defense all the time. Um, and as far as prey is concerned, no, I don't use it. I have never used prey to create defense. And I think that's where a lot of young trainers, especially, are mistaken. They think that if a dog takes one step towards a bad guy, he's in prey mode. These are, these are traps, these words, prey drive, uh, defensive drive. It's, drive doesn't mean anything to me. It's state of mind. Is he doing what he's doing because he's being defensive? He's defending you? Or is he doing what he's doing to satisfy what you've taught him to bite people? If, he, if you use prey, then your dog thinks biting is the most important thing in the world. I do not. I think no is more important than biting. Believe it. And I believe that you don't have to teach dogs how to bite. If you don't believe that, put a few dogs in the yard. They'll start biting each other sooner or later. As soon as they have, uh, I want that ball, or I want that bone, or uh, you know, get away from me, they'll use their mouths. Uh, uh, your grandmama taught you dogs bite. So I, I don't spend a lot of time teaching dogs to bite. I teach dogs when to bite, why to bite. And when to bite also encapsulates when not to bite. Those are the important things. Sport concentrates way too much on biting. And that is one fourth of the defensive protocol. Go ahead. Okay. All right, Jeffrey, I think we'll end it on that note. We appreciate you, sir. Uh, okay. Everybody, you. everybody, uh, like, subscribe. Uh, Gypsy done left all his information. Check out uh, some of uh, Gypsy's uh, mentees and students like Heka. You'll be very, uh, very impressed with that. So until the next time, guys. Thank you so much. And all you right. stay great. I shall, brother. All right, brother. Thank okay. you. Thank you.